Wow, did you get lucky by clicking on this video today? Talk about being at the right place at the right time. Me? My skin is clear, my dog is fed, my bills are paid, my solar is topped off, and my porta potty smells like straight up daisies. But let's not talk about me. Let's talk about what I have for you. We're talking about you right now. I have scoured the van life community to bring you one of the original van life OGs, and that's what we have right now. That's what we have here today. So let's just jump right into it, shall we? So let's just jump right into it. Not sure why I mentioned my skin being clear. This has been an interview and tour that's been a long time coming. I uh, met Ron at a van build a few years ago and knew right away that there was something special about him that kind of set him apart from most folks that I've met. And I even interviewed him in the past with Sev, but for audio reasons that were a little bit off or different little things that didn't work out, we just weren't able to get anything that we could use until today. We're gonna do a little interview so we can get to know him a little bit better, and then we're gonna take a, a tour of his amazing rig. And with that, I present you Ron Moat. What's happening, man? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> Just enjoying the desert and the sunny weather and getting out of the Northwest where it's cold, wet, and uh, very rainy at this time of year. And so being down here in my favorite part of winter is in Arizona is really cool. Yeah, there's a major adventure coming up for the next, uh, hopefully, three years. Well, give us a little background. Who's Ron Moak? How did you get started in this lifestyle? Give us a give us a little rundown on your life, if you don't mind. I started in the kind of the dinosaur days of fan life. Uh, well, not the 70s, but in the early 2000s when it was um, the new big sprinter vans were just coming across from um, Europe and before the Ford had a van or the ProMaster, it was basically Sprinter at the time. And I didn't buy it to get into van life. I got it because I have a business and my business um, is selling backpacks and, and uh, designing and selling backpacks and going to uh, hiker events. And so I need a van to basically go to the events and carry gear and all the stuff you need to set up for a show and getting a sprinter was good. And so for the, for the first oh, decade, um, I just basically packed all my stuff into my sprinter. It was kind of lightly designed and I just take off and go to a, a festival. And I had a old T1 sprinter, T1N, and that worked great. And then I upgraded to the 12 and now I'm in a ProMaster, but this is my third uh, sprinter um, or my third van in 18 years and uh, now I'm living it full time. I have been since uh, 2013. So I've come from having it to go someplace to living in it and, and, and just it's my home. It's very comfortable and I really enjoy it. So I feel like we're missing a really valuable story here mm -hmm. because it's not that often that we get to sit down with somebody that has lived so many different versions of their lives and adventures through their lives and still landed on a traveling lifestyle being right for them. We see some folks that come out, unfortunately, in the traveling lifestyle due to strife and yeah. financial reasons. And uh, we're seeing a lot of folks now choosing this lifestyle. You started, let, let's go back. Let's just go way back. Here we are, we're Ron Moak, we're 22 years old. Start with a start with how you moved through the things that were interesting to you in your life and that you put uh, energy into. Yeah. How did you even get involved in making tents and backpacks and things uh, for uh, hiking adventures? But back in the seventies, um, I had the the quest to go hike the Appalachian Trail, and that um, that desire as a ch you know first as a child, and then by the time I got into my twenties and could make it happen. Um, basically set the stage for a lot of what I do now, including for, for, of all things, van life. Because if you hike a trail that's 2,000 miles, you know, over a period of months, you, you get to realize what you can live without and still be comfortable. 
So you can, you realize you don't need a lot of things that you would normally need in a house. So when I did take up van life, you know, I could minimize what I need in van life. And basically this is just, you know, what I did on through hiking, I'm going a new place every day, but in luxury, you know? And so I don't need a lot of things that are normally the people associate with van life because I know how to live in a backpack you know, and hike through all kinds of weather and, you know, up over 13,000 foot passes and, you know, across deserts and the whole works, you know, with a with a pack that weighs, you know, fully loaded, less than 20 pounds. And so if you could take that knowledge and apply it to van life, you can live really rich and a very minimal, um, and this is more than that, um, in a very minimal space and still enjoy yourself. And so you don't need a lot of, you don't need a lot of interior space because you got the whole wild world around you, you know. Aren't we supposed to have a bunch of stuff to make us happy? Well, for me, possessions are kind of like, they don't define who I am. I, 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 I get something, I enjoy it while I have it. And then I, most of the time I give it away. You know? But when I turn on the internet and the TV, I'm always barraged with things that are making me feel like I'm lesser than because I don't have something. Well, that's part of the, you know, that's part of the mystique of, you know, keeping up with the Joneses, as they say. You're, you're, you have a friend who gets something and then you get, you get the hots for it and then you get it and all of a sudden you realize that it's probably not that great, you know, but you now you have it, you use it and then eventually you get too many of it and then you're really in the dumps because now you got, you know, four or five, you know, storage units full of stuff that you never use and you're paying, you know, money to hold stuff or, you know, or your house or all kinds of stuff. So for me, getting rid of stuff is, that's a blessing. It's less to worry about, you know, I don't have to think about it anymore. I don't have to worry about paying for it or storing it or, you know, and I just like, I like, I buy stuff like a lot of people do. I'm fortunately at the point where I've gone through my poverty stages, my company is successful, and I can afford to buy things. And I live in a very cheap van, relatively speaking, to live in. So I could spend, you know, $1,000 or, or, or whatever on something. And then if I discover I don't like it, I can either resell it or in most cases nowadays, I don't even spend the time to eBay it. I just hand it off to somebody because, you know, I don't have to worry about it, you know, just like I gave you a sink, you know, I was going to put it in the van. I don't want a sink in my van. So somebody else needs a sink. Why not just give it away? So in the story of Ron Moat, we, we started off young, took an interest in travel and yep. backpacking. Yeah. At one point you were involved with the forest service. Yeah. When I um, finished the AT in 77, I decided to move West with my wife and went to school in Oregon State for forestry. I got my degree there. After getting out of school, I basically realized that forestry was a good profession, but there was more students and graduates in forestry than there were jobs in forestry. And at the time, this was back in like 82, 81, 82 timeframe, and personal computers were just beginning to hit the market. You know, we'd gone through the Ataris and, Apple had just come out, and then finally IBM came out with their their PC. I was playing with some of that in college, doing some programming and things like that, and I just, I had a knack for it for some reason. And um, it was too young before, I was too early before we got to the whole hacker movement, but I learned how to program, and I spent 20 years in high technology writing computer code and doing all kinds of stuff, traveling all the United States and even parts of the world uh, with different projects and doing things. And that was really fun. But as time went on, you know, you get older and everything's changing and you, you want to settle down a little bit, at least mentally in terms of how you're learning stuff. And around mid nineties, I got cancer. Um, and that's kind of a, a life changer, you know, getting something like that when you go through a period and went I had it well I went through it for about nine months in total between what the time was it it was uh, testicular 
the same thing as uh, Lance Armstrong had and some other things, some other people. And fortunately, because it was curable. For me, it was a life changer because I had a, you know, after school, going thing, I have a family, I had a house, you know, it was the typical stuff, you know, you, you working for, for a corporation for a number of years, you know, you get fat and you get, you know, the typical programmer lifestyle, you know, you see them on TV, I wasn't any different. And you go through that and all of a sudden you realize that, you know, your days are numbered, you know. And you also realize how fortunate because once you come through it, you realize that, you know, every day from here on to the rest of your life is a freebie. You know, I, I could have easily been dead because when I first got diagnosed with cancer, they said your lifespan is going to be, you know, at best three to five years before they had diagnosed what the actual cancer was. But based upon what they thought it was, he said, this is where you're going to be, you know. And so you sort of said, OK, well, that's depressing. <laughs> but, you know, I put it out of my head and says, OK, well, you know, they're preliminary and, and they get around to at some point in time actually diagnosing it and then knowing how to treat it. But anyway, after I got through cancer, I kind of said, OK, now how do I think about the rest of my life? You know, and uh, what do I do? You know, and we at that point in time, I was out of shape or way overweight, like 250 pounds or something like that. And so I said, well, it was a kid on 20 years uh, anniversary of when I did the, the AT to begin with. So uh, we decided to go back and hike a uh, 20th anniversary hike of um, at least part of the AT. So we did 200 miles. It was my wife and myself and my son, who was um, 13 at the time. And we did 700 miles on the AT over a summertime, lost a lot of weight, got into shape, and got that whole outdoor vibe again. I made all the gear for us. I made packs. I made all kinds of stuff. I made tent, even sleeping bags. So I was making the whole panoply of gear for that trip, you know, because I'd made gear over the years for different trips. And it just got that whole thing going and getting that whole outdoor, you know, back to life again. And then three years later, in 2000, the hike the Pacific Crest Trail, the whole thing beginning to end. Made all the gear for that for myself and my son. And it was just started that thing of, you know, I like this. Why did you make your own gear when you could have just bought some? Well, that's a good question. I, I've been making gear. I made gear actually for my first hike in, in 77. You know, I just... I have this, I'm a designer now, or have been for the last 20 years, and I just like, you know, going beyond and, and making my own stuff. I'll, I'll take something and I'll, I'll expand upon it or make it my own and just solve problems. And so that's just something I do and I love to do it. You know, I'll make gear even if I don't even use it just to make it. Um, and so, and, and a lot of the gear that we were making in the 70s or the, in the 90s didn't exist, the lightweight gear, the ultralightweight gear. It had just become, the ultralight phenomena just started a few years earlier. And so a lot of the gear wasn't available in mainstream manufacturers. You couldn't go to REI and buy it. You couldn't, the you know, North Base wasn't making it. Sierra Designs didn't make it and, and nobody made it. And so we, we experimented, we made our own gear. And then in 2000, when I did the, 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 the PCT, I got enthralled about making it more because there's a, a bunch of us at the time who decided that, you know, um, there might be a, an opportunity here. And so in about 2002, after I got off the um, PCT, I decided to shift gears out of computers um, and shift gears into making and designing gear. And there was probably about a half a dozen of us at the time in different places of the country, and we were all friends, and we were all independently designing gear and starting companies. And most of us said, we're gonna, not going to be in business in five years, but what the hell? You know, you never can tell. Try it. And none of us knew anything. We didn't know how to start a business. We didn't know how to really design. We were all do-it-yourselfers. You know, we knew how to run a sewing machine. That was it. But all the other stuff you had to learn from scratch. And most of us are still in business. And most of us are pretty successful at it. And it took time. You know, we created our own websites. We created our own signs. We finally have figured out how to manufacture stuff. We figured out how to sell it, you know, how to do all that stuff. And it was fun. 
you know, it was all low key. It was all just kind of like, you know, see your pants. And eventually, if it worked hard enough and you get up and you get, um, well, for us, it was good because for the, for the most part, what we did was we were interacting one on one with our customers. And so we do a design, we send it out to our customer and they would use it. And then they would say, well, this works, this doesn't work, you know. And the next production run, we change a bunch of stuff. So you were always talking back and forth to your customer. And when you do that, you learn, you know, how to understand what he's saying. You know, a lot of people sell their gear through a dealer and a dealer has a whole different take on what, you know, a problem is with a product and a customer has a different take. So you you got two different customers, the dealer and the and the customer. So that was good for us for a number of years. And so far it turned out successful. And you know, I've, I only wanted to make enough time and money to get me from basically 50 to retirement. You know, and that was my goal. Just just to keep myself entertained, make make a few bucks, retire, and then I don't know, you know, watch TV and soap operas for the rest of my life. But that didn't happen. I got to travel and I got the travel bug and I've been to Europe a fair amount of times. I've been to Asia a lot because we have a lot of uh we have we sell a lot of gear in Asia, and we also have our gear produced most of it in Asia, and so it has been great. And now I want to do the whole world on a van, so travel the whole world. And part of it will be traveling, part of it will be visiting dealers and other people, you know, and just finding out what their problems are there and how we can solve them and make a better company. So you started your company around the age of fifty years old. Yeah, and. Uh, the company's progressed to the point that it is now. You're on the backside of your day-to-day -day involvement yeah. with it now. You've turned it over to the newer generation that are going to take the ball and run with it. Yeah. And you're taking this time for yourself to live out some of these adventures that might have been cost prohibitive when you were younger. Oh, yeah. And this is your third iteration of a van that you've built. Mind walking us through your van and, and giving us an idea of what a guy that's gone through three builds with a decent sized budget mm -hmm. has been able to arrive at, this is the, the platform that I wanna travel the world in. Not having all that in, all that YouTube stuff, you know, I could build it the way it fit me and my lifestyle and what how I travel. That's why I have an open van versus having a bed across the back. And I like, cause I like a long bed, this bed is 80 inches. And a normal van has, you know, the max you can get, even if you do a cross and with a bump out, is usually about six and a half feet. You know, this is almost seven feet. It's a full length van. There's, you know, uh, over 13 feet from the, from the seats to the back, you know, and if you're on a rainy day and you want to, don't want to go out and, and uh, you know, wander in the rain, you can get up and walk, walk around here, stretch your legs, you know, have a bunch of different seat, seating positions to be comfortable with, um, you know, and all the windows, um, is the other thing I did was put a whole lot of windows in here. So no matter where I sit in here, I have a ringside seat to the outside, you know, and I had my first van had, you know, one window in the door, two windows in the back and up here. And that was just a nightmare. I mean, it was like, I felt like I was in a, I was in a worldwide wide world. And I felt like I was in a turtle shell, you know, and I don't you put like these windows in. I put all these windows in. Yeah. So that's pretty easy. It's a little nerve wracking to do the big cut. But, you know, you know, once you realize. Measure twice. Or four times. As long as you got your lines right. But the, the thing is of it is that even if you really, really screw up, you know, there are body shops out there who will fix it for you. You know, so how badly can you do it, you know? Um, so you can always say, OK, well, I screwed up. It might cost you $1,000 to take it someplace and have them patch it, repair it, and paint it so you'll never notice it. But you really can't. You're not like you're ripping the engine apart. It's just basically tin, you know? So you don't get overly scared about it because if the worst case is, you know, it, you, you blow it and you, you cost a bit, at least you know you're got it out. You know, a lot of times we just freeze ourselves because we just don't want to make any mistakes at all. And my philosophy is just go for it, you know? And, you know, most of the time that really works. And so the opening, having this open, gives me a lot of serenity. You know, I can just sit here, I keep it clean like this most of the time. I like that. 
uh, because I can just sit here and look outside and ponder all the things I want to or don't want to do and not have to have a lot of stress. What I, the other thing I did was, which is a major thing, was I really tried to calculate how much storage I needed. And then I said I needed to have at least 5% additional storage over top of that. That way, I always have empty cabinets or empty space that no matter how junky it could be, I could throw stuff in the cabinets in less than five minutes and have it look like this. And I could bring it out later and sort it, but it it's, it's never takes long to set this thing up so it's clean and like this. You know, so that was a major thing. And a lot of people complain or or look at this and say, okay, well, why all the windows? You know, what about stealth? What about thermal and all the other stuff? You know, and just quickly on that, I think they're kind of, to me, they're myths. Uh, stealth is kind of a myth because I've never really seen, I've never had, I've only had one knock on the door in 350,000 miles in, uh, you know, 18 years. And stealth to me is basically, you get knocks a lot, you get knocks on the door if you if you stay somewhere too long, or if you drive a junky place because nobody wants a junky, you know, vehicle in front of their house. You know, you have a nice vehicle, you're upscaling the neighborhood in a lot of cases. And in terms of, of windows, if you know what you're doing, it's not an issue. I have these these blinds back here are all thermal blinds. You know, they go up and down easily. They got two cells in them. You know, back to back. Show me. You know. So they just, they go up, stay, you know, so they're very easy. There's a, each one of these things, there's a cell in the front and a cell in the back, so they're thermal. And that, and that acts two dead zones of air in there. And then, because if you feel it, you've got heat on here. This is hot, you know, but you bring this down here, this is cold. And in the, in the um, when it's cold outside, it does the same thing. This will be warm and it's cold on the window. And so it is, blocking a lot of the heat loss that you would normally have associated with a window. And plus I have five inches of insulation in all the walls. So you can overcome, you know, problems with creative um, solutions. And having a window isn't an issue in terms of thermal loss. It just, you know, if you know what you're doing. And these aren't that expensive. These are Home Depot. They're Bally blinds. You get them um, Home Depot, you, they're custom you know, in the custom section, in the like the home decor section, and each one of these is about um, uh, I think I paid six hundred for the four of them, so six hundred divided by four, you know, um, which is a, a fair amount of money, but for a blind that's that easy to use, you know, and looks that good, and it, it, you know, you don't have to sit there. And, put all kinds of reflectics in your window. It's a pretty cheap investment overall. Why a fold-up bed rather than a fixed bed situation when you design this? Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, it's a longer bed. And I, I sleep position is all, often on the stomach or side. And this one with the 80 inches, you're always on the bed, no matter what. So the other thing is um, I like dual use for everything I have. I, the more uses I have, the more valuable it is to me. And this also is a, a couch and a bed, but unlike a lot of the uh, home-built um, couches, they're vertical in the back, you know? So when you sit on them, they're kind of uncomfortable. And so this one has an incline, so when you sit on it, you're at the right angle. So you can sit on it for hours, and I have my legume down here, and I can sit here and look out and do work or whatnot, videos and things like that. So that was a key. The other thing is, is that a lot of people have a rear bed because they justify it because of the fact they don't like to make up their bed. And I understand that. And they also want to put in a, um, a garage for all the bikes and everything they want to put in. Well, I have a bike back here, but I'm old enough. I don't need a garage anymore. I don't need to carry a kayak and I don't need to carry all that, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, I just like to walk or ride a bike, you know, and that's pretty much my, you know, my thing. And so I wanted something that um, was very fast. And this is, this bed 
converts from a bed, um, from a couch to a bed and back in less time than it takes you to arrange your blankets on the on a fixed bed. It's literally that fast, you know. And at night, all I do is just take these two pillows off, flip it around, take that off. Put that over, drop it down, and you've got a bed. Where did you, did you get a bed like this? Did you it's, have um, it made? Yeah, I had it made. Um, it's uh, a semi-custom. Uh, part of it was, uh, and then for putting put it back together, it's just reverse process. But um, the hinges were the critical thing, um, the, the flip over hinges are the critical thing and those are actually available it's getting somebody who can actually build it for you that's the um the, the key um and i was trying to find somebody to um to build them from other people because i've had so many requests for the, how to build this bed because as you can see even talking to you it takes literally nothing and now you're back to couch mode so I went from bed to couch, I mean couch to bed to couch, and nothing. And I can do this every morning and it's fine and it's comfortable. If somebody was watching this and they wanted a bed like that, how would, who would they contact? I don't have a good solution for that because the people I did who built this bed um, basically screwed it up, <laughs> to be polite. Um, I gave them a, I gave them CAD drawings of exact things I wanted on the bed, the height of the bed. They screwed that up. I have another bed like this in my other van, um, and they uh, somewhere along the line between they're making that bed. They uh, the, the people changed how the um, the flip over worked, and these guys got the new one. And the new one when I flipped it over, when this one when I first came, it flipped it over. Then it would drop down in the front. It would just kind of lean over. And the guy said, well, they changed it. and They didn't know how to fix it. And Could so, you get a bed like this out of an RV supply no, website? No. Um, I might be able to dig up the, the hinge thing if, we, if you can find somebody. And we also have to modify the, the hinges so that they will block. I, I re reverse engineered it and figured out what it was doing because I have another bed like it in my other van. And I could look at that and figure out how it worked and then, and then modify this to, to match that. And so it works for me. I don't. Uh, they were giving me a, a thing to, to hang down below here to hold it up, but that was kind of janky. But yeah, I, I've been for the last couple of years. I've been trying to find somebody who could build the damn thing. But uh, so far, because um, I think it's a it's a wonderful option for many people, because um, it's it's very comfortable. Uh, it gives you a lot of options, and then the the whole bottom comes out. There's all kinds of drawers underneath this thing, so it's really accessible, you know, and it looks like a, a nice piece of furniture, you know. You mentioned uh, giving me your sink that you had acquired for the build uh -huh. and decided against. Why did you decide against the sink in this build? Seems like everybody has a sink. Why did you not want one? You know, if you watch the thousands of uh, YouTube videos by people that says, you know, they come out, they got this big, massive, deep sink, you know, and they're, t and they're so proud of the sink. And their, their, their primary justification for having a really big, deep sink is because they cook a lot. That's the first thing they say, I have a big sink, I like to cook. Well, you know, frankly, I've been cooking for the family, for myself, for 30 years. And I don't really use a sink for cooking, you know. What I use a sink for is for washing dishes. I use a sink to hold dirty dishes until I get around to cleaning them the next day. But I don't really use a sink for cooking. You know, I might wash off some vegetables, but it's never really used for the cooking process. It's just used for kind of a little bit of prep and cleanup. And the problem is, is if you listen to those people, they'll also say they put their, their dirty dishes in the sink and then clean it the next day. Well, what happens is Stepping back a little bit, to me the most important, because I'm a through hiker 
and I always had to carry my water or I had to find water in streams and things like that. To me, water is the most precious resource you have out here in Van Life. It is the most precious resource, especially if you're down here in the desert and even other places, because sometimes it's hard to find water sources. You know, um, here you've got drinking fountain or drinking uh, water stations all over the place. But if you go up into, you know, in the northern half of the country, like Idaho, other places, it's kind of hard to find water. And so to me, water's one purpose is to drink. It's not to wash dishes, you know, it's not to wash my hair or my face, all that stuff I have. It's just for drinking. And so if I'm only going to use it for drinking, I don't need a sink, you know. And so I washed my dishes with, you know, um, vinegar and paper towel or some other way to wipe things out. And that works. And uh, I want the extra counter space because I do cook a lot. I cook, you know, I mean, you know that. <laughs> right. So, and so I don't... Uh, it just minimizes things. Plus, it's one thing that uh, a sink is also has gray water. Gray water stinks if you don't know how to plumb it right. You know, then you got to discharge the gray water. And the less complex systems I have, the less problems you're going to have on things breaking in the field. Speaking about cooking, why don't you tell us and show us a little bit about how you cook in your van? Well, basically, um, for the most part, I have uh, a couple of on day to day stuff, um, I have an induction stove. Uh, it's a single burner induction stove, which is uh, pretty much what I, all I need. And then to augment that, I, I cook a lot of Asian food and other stuff, pasta. I also carry uh, an electric uh, kettle. So that just plugs in. All my, all my uh, utilities are electric. I don't do any propane. And so I can use this for cooking pastas, soups, all kinds of stuff. This is a plastic one, so it's designed for that kind of stuff. You know, making hot water for um, coffee, things like that, tea, and plugs in. And then this, and on top of that, I have, uh, I cook with a big wok that's like 14 pounds. And I have an uh, instant pot. I have, um, I have a grill that's charcoal, if you want, if I want to do that, if I've got time. I also, uh, a butane stove that I can cook either in here or out on a, um, a table outside for something. Um, so I have all the kinds of stuff I need, but I just try to keep the cooking simple, you know. If someone wanted to go with an induction cooktop, what type of system would they need in order to be able to run it? Well, you can actually run pro, uh, bu um, <laughs> you can actually run induction on pretty much any kind of a, a battery system. You don't necessarily have to have lithium. I'd recommend lithium for, for the most part. But even if you do have a lithium, you have to have one that has multiple batteries that can give you the, the, the they call it a C rating. Um, uh, but you can do it on AGM batteries uh, with no problems. Um, I only cook uh, about 900 watts. This, this is like 1800 watt, but I never really go over 900. So and you have it it's on a, the it's low a very, setting or the uh, medium setting? Yes, yeah, the medium setting. Like uh, on the, this has settings from zero to five and or zero to ten, and so it's about a five. And the, I can do uh, stir fry and all kinds of stuff with that. Um, so I currently have a, a much beefier electrical system, um, but you don't have to have a lot. Uh, can we talk in terms of how many watts your uh, inverter needs to be and if it has to be pure sign or can it be modified and how many amps you have to have on on hand? Yeah, I would uh, To be honest at no point nowadays would I buy a Anything but a pure sign wave inverter. I don't think there's a there the, the price of inverters in the last You know decade, you know have dropped in price the the wide come up the, the squares the square wave inverters are just passe. It's kind of like the old uh, PWM, you know, solar controllers, they're just, you don't bother with them. There's just no reason to have them. Because most of the time, you know, it's not so much for something like this. Uh, electrical devices are are generally fine. What, where your problem is, is when you're dealing with electronics and those kinds of things. If you're running a TV or those kinds of stuff, they really like to have the sign. They don't like to have the square wave. And so that's the, the critical. How much power you need depends upon what you're doing. I have a 3,000 watt um, pure sign inverter in here. Um, 
but in the past I've used 2000 watt, uh, watt inverters and it works just fine on uh, this kind of stuff. I just bought the heavier duty one because I've got plugs all over the place and I want to run things simultaneously. If it's rated at 3000 watts, what's the peak on that? And what's the continuous? Uh, 3000 continuous and peak is six. Okay. But, you know, if you're running 3000 peak, you're probably, you know, you're probably overcooking your um, batteries. Plus, it's probably just like a startup. Yeah, I would, I only use, uh, to be honest, I think I, I never run more than a thousand watts at any given time. Um, I, not because I can't, but, and I have the battery power to do it, but I just don't need it. So, and I have probably more battery power than, you know, 10 van lifers put together. So, you do have a lot of battery. Yeah. Let's walk through some of your other stuff. What was important to you? You saw the bed, you wanted it to fold away. This is your cooking situation. It's all electric. How about starting since we're at towards the front of the van so we can just keep with the starting at the front moving back theme. Uh, show us your refrigerator if you wouldn't mind and that drawer on, on top of the refrigerator, why you chose uh, this refrigerator and why you chose the uh, items in the drawer above it. I created the uh, refrigerator in the front because it's accessible from both inside and outside because I can drop my table down and actually cook on the table and sit outside, get access to the refrigerator. And then I have a, a, a drawer where I call my hydration drawer. Basically has all the coffee, uh, teas, different teas, um, drinks, emergency for if I'm walking a lot, I need to have electrolytes, things like that. And so that's all in my hydration drawer. And so they work together. And, and then this refrigerator takes up this much and then the rest of the stuff is pots and pans and spices and all kinds of, of stuff. Where could somebody get a, a Wi-Fi router like that and the antenna? Um, basically, I found it on um, YouTube. There's a, there's a site called Internet, Internet Resource Center, a couple, of, uh, couple, and they do all kinds of travel. They have a boat, they have a motorhome, they have a, one of these um, type of a vehicle. And they do, all they do is just Internet stuff. You know, and they talk about who's got the latest plans, how the plans are changed, all kinds of stuff. And they also talk about mobile routers and the kind you have and the kind of other people have. And so they have a lot of a lot of resource information. How are you powering all this stuff? All this is powered by two Tesla batteries, um, two Tesla modules out of a, a Rec Tesla, um, which is the equivalent of about uh, 800, well, over 800 amp hours of lithium. Um, and 800 usable amp hours? Yeah. Wrecked Tesla, how did you source batteries from a wrecked Tesla? How, do you, how does a person go about finding those? eBay. So. How do you know that they weren't uh, damaged? Well, when you see them, you know, they're all in the original plastic containers and, you know, inside of it, you know, so they're all protected and, and you can test them, you know, in terms of the, and look at the thing. It's, and the plastic is open, so you can see all the termin terminals and all the, um, the little wire jumpers that are uh, fuses and see they're not blown. Are tw Tesla batteries 12 volt? They're 24 volt batteries. So they're a little bit and they don't have all the protections that the newer like Battleborns have and those kinds of things. So they're they're much dicier to use and the only reason I did it, um, could do it, was thanks to you. You know, um, so and that was because I went down to the um, van build for the last well, the four years before it was, you know, we had the COVID. And um, I learned a lot about solar installing for other people, reading manuals, and I got enough information, knowledge, and competence to basically do that myself. I wouldn't do it probably today because there's other good options, but at the time it was a pretty good option. It was, and it's really cheap, uh, was cheap. It was like, uh, I think about uh, 22, $24 for the two batteries. And that's for 800 amp hours, you know, and so that's 800 usable. 800 usable, yeah. What? How many watts are you putting into those on the roof there? I've got a th almost a thousand nine hundred and forty-five watts on the roof. So, and uh, are you going through a single solar controller? I have a single solar controller, and uh, yeah, it's just they're all in parallel, so it doesn't have to max out the voltage. So, you talked about curtains 
and how you can do some mild climate control with the right types of curtains that are insulated. What other uh, climate controls would be the next step for you? You you have a, a fan here. Is that a max fan? Well, yeah, this is a max fan here. I have basically the the curtains are kind of like passive um, um, systems. The, the curtains, the insulation. There's um, three inches of. Uh, Wool, wool insulation. What's um, that called? Well, it's not the Havelock. Actually, you can buy wool insulation at uh, at Home Depot, believe it or not. <laughs> so it's just cloth? It's wool cloth insulation? It's wool cloth, yeah. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a batting. I put that in. And then in front of that is uh, uh, two inches of uh, rigid foam. And then um, on the other side of that is these uh, um, cedar. Um, that's a half inch. Like a five eighths inch cedar, which is also uh, part of the insulation. Is that what we see here? The yeah, cedar? this is all five inch tongue and groove. Tongue and groove, five inch old growth, um, uh, no knot cedar. This is the kind of stuff you see in um, uh, very high end. You can't buy this anywhere. It's in showers. No and, not K N O T. Yeah, it's uh, you know, you have to know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody to get this stuff. And and I have a a friend who's a uh, worked worked in a um, as a lumber broker, and I went to the mill and bought and got this straight from the mill in Oregon. So, do you prefer the Max fan over the Fantastic fan? I do because of the fact that it has a lot of uh, capabilities. It has an on-off automatic thing, but I never use that. So if it hits a certain temperature, comes on, I just come up here and push the button and turn it on. And it's reversing. It has like ten levels of air. So uh, this is the first level. The second thing I have um, for heat, uh, well, for cooling, is this. I also have an air conditioner in here. A standalone. You have an air conditioner in your in your van. I have well, beside the one in the engine, I have a standalone air conditioner, um, which is zero breeze. A zero breeze. It's just come out. It was a Kickstarter up until like a few months ago, and so. And this is a full-on legit air conditioner, and uh, it's like a, a 3,000 BTU somewhere in that neighborhood. And so, uh, does it kick hot air out? Do you have to vent it out? Yeah, it, it vents out. I have a adapter that I made, that, and it has uh, two outputs here for input for uh, fresh, output for the hot air. So and does that have a hose that hooks onto yeah, it? Yeah, it has two hoses, and they mount to a board I made that mounts up here, and they just output here. And then there's a special hose that comes out the front, um, which directs the cold air out, and then I just block this area out, and that reduces the amount of area I have to cool. It also does acts as a humidif dehumidifier and uh, outputs all the moisture. So you have a tank in there you can empty water out? Is I just it? use a, like a, um, uh, we do like a one-gallon uh, tea thing you know um, or fruit juice jar and put the hose on that and then fill it and empty it when it fills up go wild and live young we're gonna have to end it right here this time guys with the air conditioner due to some corrupt files but i want to thank ron for giving us his time and you for watching all the way to the end if you'd like to see more like this i encourage you to click the link in the upper right hand corner where i have mike one of my all-time best